So it's a pleasure to have uh, Professor Yorki, Sandro Yorki, who is um, currently at the Davis Institute in the Department of Physiology and Molecular Biology. Is that the name of the department? Cell Biology. Cell Biology, not Molecular Biology, sorry. Um, at the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, which typically is colder than this place. And um, Chandler is really the master of uh, studying um, cell calcium cycling. And he's done beautiful work on uh, calcium cycling in, cardiac, in cells, including cardiac cells, and in particular the connection between calcium um, uh, handling by the cell and arrhythmias in the context of mutations, such as calcium mutation in cardiac in the uh, CPVT arrhythmias. <coughs> so, uh, Chandler and I met for the first time, I believe, in Hungary, in this beautiful city called uh, Zeged, where there is a very renowned and excellent medical school. Vitamin C was discovered there in that medical school. And since then, we've been maintaining on and off uh, uh, our contact and seeing each other in meetings. And I was really delighted that he agreed to uh, come and talk to us about cell calcium. Um, Chandor is uh, um, also involved in, as an associate director of this uh, Davis Heart and Lung Institute at uh, the Ohio State University. He received his PhD, although he's originally from Hungary, he received his PhD from the uh, Russian Academy of Sciences, or the USSR Academy of Sciences, it's called, in the beautiful city of St. Petersburg, which I believe at the time that he received the PhD was still Leningrad. It was. It was Leningrad. So that's where he received his education. He then came to this country, went to University of Texas in Stony Brook, which at the time had a very distinguished physiology department. Uh, headed by Buzz Brown, those of you who know Buzz. And um, after that, he remained in Texas uh, for a period of time and from there moved with his entire laboratory to um, Columbus to Ohio State. So <coughs> we're delighted to have you. Thank you everyone for the nice introduction. It's been a very exciting day been uh, have learned a lot and uh, uh, I hope I'm not overloaded with all this information okay we like to overload our visitors <laughs> right. and uh, so today and I've been really impressed by you know by the presentations here and by your facilities I mean you guys must be like really lucky to have such nice, you know, facilities, including actually this room also. Uh, uh, our, our building is also relatively new, but it's it's far from the way how this looks like. So uh, today uh, I would like to uh, talk about uh, research on. Uh, regulation of calcium release in uh, a cardiac muscle uh, and how abnormalities in this regulation lead to certain cardiac diseases uh, including arrhythmias uh, kind of uh, research we've been doing in uh, our lab for the last maybe 10-15 years and just in a way of a historical background so the whole field of calcium signaling and excitation contraction coupling uh, can be traced back. It started by the uh, famous uh, experiments of Ringer on Lon London tap water in uh, about 150 or 40 years ago. And I just learned that uh, about, 100, uh, about 150 years ago, this university was established just to give sort of a historical of contest and it was not about uh, another 100 years 
before the molecular mechanisms of cardiac excitation contraction coupling have been kind of developed in the more or less modern form by Alessandro Fabiato and others in uh, the, the, the elegant experiments in the end of 80s. And then it's interesting that actually first evidence that the Reining receptor is involved in cardiac arrhythmias been uh, were kind of obtained even before that in the middle of the last century. And then, uh, of course, purification and cloning of the Reining receptor in the 80s and 90s marked the beginning of the molecular biology uh, age in, uh, in uh, the calcium signaling uh, and uh, at the actually beginning of this century mutations uh, found in Reining receptor and associated proteins kind of started a new, completely new era of research uh, where the molecular mechanisms, underlying molecular mechanisms of cardiac arrhythmias have been started to be elucidated. And uh, so this is uh, sort of a, a very schematic uh, presentation of excitation, cardiac excitation contraction coupling so in a way how Fabiato and others kind of put it together for us. So this is just a sort of small portion of cardiac myocytes. So we all know that during electrical excitation, calcium comes in through voltage dependent calcium channels and it binds to and activates this calcium release channel called the Reinin receptor that sits in the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And when this Reinin receptor channel opens, then a much larger amount of calcium is released to the cytosol, leading to activation of contractile proteins, so contraction occurs. And then during relaxation, most of this calcium is taken back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Some of it is removed out of the cell by the electron channel sodium calcium exchanger. So, this is uh, known as calcium-induced calcium release. Uh, and uh, calcium-induced calcium release, it's sort of a classical example of a biological amplification process. So when sort of uh, uh, a trigger signal uh, generates a, a, an output signal that is sort of bigger than the uh, input signal, so this is to generate a positive feedback loop. And we all know that uh, situations or mechanisms like this, based on such positive feedback, are intrinsically unstable and tend to oscillations. Yet we know that in normal heart, you know, the beating of a normal heart is very rhythmic, very stable. So from the very beginning, discovery of this mechanism, so scientists were kind of wondering what keeps, you know, calcium release, calcium induced calcium release from spontaneous oscillation. So from the very beginning, uh, there was this idea that there must be some very powerful mechanisms that control calcium release, preventing it from self-activation and oscillation. And then, of course, we know that uncert uncertain disease conditions, such as arrhythmia, spontaneous releases of calcium do occur, and then they lead to this uh, arrhythmogenic depolarizations of the surface membrane through the electrogenic sodium calcium exchange, and the, the, uh, these depolarizations are large enough and reach threshold for the action potential, then we have actually can have a, a, an ex, ex, extra systolic sort of beat. And so, uh, so the main question that uh, scientists, uh, investigators in the field of excitation contraction coupling were sort of uh, trying to resolve during the past maybe 15, 20 years is how calcium induced calcium release controlled normally in normal heart and then how 
what happens in disease heart to result to, to, to result to sort of loss of this uh, stability what what happens uh, to to, to uh, loss this uh, for, for this control mechanism to become compromised uh, so when I entered this field uh, as a young postdoc uh, uh, in some, some end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, so the state of the art for kind of studying excitation contraction coupling uh, or grinding receptor activity was the lipid planner, uh, lipid bilayer technique. Uh, Obviously, you know that the running receptor is localized inside the, the cell, you know, in, the, in an intracellular membrane, so it's not approachable by traditional patch clamp techniques, so you cannot get to it with a pipette. So the way how investigators get around it is that what we did, we sort of isolated membranes of the sarcoplasmic reticulum containing the running receptor channel and then we fuse them into a lipid bilayer. And then so this bilayer cup is essentially sort of a, a front end. We, we have instead of a patch pipe at this, this bilayer cup, when the channel sits in sort of in this bilayer and we can measure the currents flowing through, through the channel. And then uh, sort of if you start measuring uh, the activity of the, this channel as a function of calcium on the cytosolic side, so then you can obtain sort of a, a, a graph like this. So there is, you know, the open probability of the channel, which is a measure of activity as a function of cytosolic calcium. It's sort of normally uh, the, the concentration of free calcium resting around 100 nanomoles, so if you start increasing calcium above it, the open probability keeps increasing until it sort of reaches a plateau, then as you increase calcium further, it starts going down. So the increase of, cal of uh, open probability with increasing calcium, of course, is consistent with a calcium-induced calcium release mechanism. And this decrease, first people started kind of thinking that maybe this is the negative control mechanism that required for stabilization of calcium in this calcium release. So maybe, you know, in addition to an activation mechanism, also there is a calcium inactivation process that helps to keep calcium in this calcium release in the check. But realistically, when people look, so this concentration are pretty high uh, to be really kind of uh, working in the cell. So for uh, so people kind of remain skeptical about this uh, mechanism. So then we sort of decided to look at the activity of the channel as a function of calcium on the luminal side of the channel that would correspond to calcium inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And we found that Actually, also, it depends quite strongly on concentration of luminal calcium. And sort of the higher the luminal calcium, uh, the higher concentration of calcium on the, on the SR side of the channel, the higher the activity of the channel. But what is interesting that, of course, that normally, in the resting mice side, the calcium concentration in the sarcoplasmic reticulum is really high. Indeed, it's you know the storage compartment from which calcium is released, and it's actually around one millimole. And what is interesting that during the release process, you would expect this calcium to decline because calcium would be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So during release, you would expect you know uh, the channel activity to go down together with decrease of calcium concentration. In, in, in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and we thought that, oh, maybe this is sort of the uh, control mechanism that would help to, you know, maintain the stability of calcium in this calcium release, and we sort of uh, uh, basically spent maybe the next 10, 15 years 
try to better sort of understand this mechanism which we started calling store dependent deactivation. Uh, uh, one of the first, of course, uh, most import, uh, important questions about this mechanism is what its molecular sort of nature, what's the luminal sensor. And we all know that, you know, the rhyming receptor, it's a huge protein, but uh, in addition to its kind of uh, huge size uh, on its own, it also carries a number of proteins attached to it both on the cytosolic and luminal side. So together there is about, and this list grow, growing continuously now, I think there is about 18 proteins known to be associated with the Rhinin receptor. We of course were most interested in proteins that associated with it with the luminal side, and these proteins are triad injunctin. They, they sit, these two proteins sit in the, in, in, in the membrane, and then they also they anchor uh, calcequestrin, which is an intra uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum uh, calcium binding protein. So basically, these sort of four proteins form the, the basis of the uh, channel uh, of, of, of the channel complex. <coughs> and so, uh, one possibility, of course, that luminal calcium sort of acts on the running receptor itself, the other that it acts through some other of these luminal proteins and to kind of uh, look or address this possibility, we again resorted to the lipid bilayer approach and we collaborated with uh, Larry Jones, who, was, uh, who is uh, like one of the leading biochemists uh, in, in cardiac EC coupling, and he could sort of isolate all these proteins and purify them, and that's what we actually needed. Uh, so what we did, first we took so-called native grinding receptors, so this is just uh, taken these vesicles as they are, they're supposed to have all the proteins kind of attached to them. And this is like the, the typical effect of changing luminal calcium. So if you go from low luminal calcium to high, the channel activity increases, right? And then what we did, we just purified the running receptor biochemically, stripped it of all the other associated proteins, and we found that, you know, uh, the purified protein was no longer able to respond to changes in luminal calcium concentration. Then we sort of started adding back, you know, all these luminal proteins, maybe three of them, and then the, uh, the, the activity, the ch channel regained its ability. And I mean, these experiments, it was a really short paper, but these experiments took like a really long time. And so what we essentially found that uh, you need uh, calcequestrin and triadin in order for grinding receptor to be able to respond to luminal calcium concentration. Then uh, our next main sort of question or priority became that, okay, we sort of see this in an isolated system, but how much trust you can put into this, you know, you, are, you take a protein out of the cell and you do these experiments, but is this something really, you know, what happens also in, in a real myocyte, in a live cell? So, and in order to test this and sort of verify sort of the effects that we uh, saw were, were happening, we sort of came up with this strategy to use a, a decoy peptide that would correspond actually to the uh, binding site of uh, the triadin to the calcequestrin. And of course the expectation was uh, that if calcequestrin is indeed required for this sort of luminal sensing and it's important for stabilization of, of calcium induced calcium release, then we would see some you know, physiological effects and uh, 
most likely, uh, you know, as predicted by our hypothesis, we would see that, you know, if we if we inhibit interaction of pulsate which is our presumed luminal sensor, then we would see the release to become dis destabilized. And to do this, we kind of use the the, the viral delivery system. So we 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 had this. We made a virus to express, you know, this uh, particular uh, decoy peptide inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and then we kind of after cell expressed it, and this would be verified by FLEP. We, we looked at these cells, and it turned out that indeed the uh, calcium release gets sort of destabilized. And these are like typical. You know, uh, calcium and electrophysiological recording that we do in our cells. So this is just the action potentials. And these are line scan images of, of calcium changes. And these are uh, these are average calcium traces. So in control cell, you know, there is a, like nice uh, regular calcium transients. And in cells transfected with this peptide, so we see uh, spontaneous releases so calcium in this calcium release indeed becomes kind of destabilized we, we see it starts oscillating uh, so based on on this and kind of similar experiments so we came up with this sort of uh, the view of regulation of uh, grinding receptor by luminal calcium and calcicuestrin. So what we think what's happening is that uh, when the luminal calcium concentration, or concentration in the sarcoplasmic reticulum is low, like right after calcium release, then calcicuestrin inhibits through interaction with this triadin, in, it inhibits the rinding receptor and it makes the calcium signaling refractor, uh, the rhyming receptor is kind of unable for kind of spontaneous activation. Then when the SR store gets refilled, calcium increases. So calcium binds to calcicuestrin and it relieves the inhibition by calcicuestrin of the uh, rinding receptor and under these conditions which happens kind of toward the end of the diastolic period the rinding receptor becomes uninhibited or primed so under this condition it's ready for uh, calcium dependent activation by calcium that comes during EC coupling and then sort of release occurs and then calcium goes down again and under these conditions Again, cal uh, 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 calcicuestrin inhibits the uh, rinding receptor. Uh, so just to kind of quickly summarize, uh, so what we kind of think is that calcicuestrin is actually serves as a, as a luminal sensor and it inhibits rinding receptor at low luminal calcium concentration, contributing to the uh, diastolic refractoriness of the rinding receptor or calcium signaling that prevents, under normal conditions, spontaneous activation of this self-regenerating calcium into calcium release process. And uh, yeah, that uh, calcicuestrin doesn't interact with the rinding receptor directly, but rather through this uh, intermediate uh, protein triad. Uh, and uh, what is interesting uh, that sort of our conclusion also, uh, we get uh, a support for our conditions from experiments designed by nature. So it turned out we were actually very kind of happy to see uh, these kind of reports that started to come out. Uh, the first report was actually from from Israel on a, uh, on a, a type of arrhythmia which is called 
polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, uh, which was caused by mutations in L sequester. And uh, so short, in short CPVT uh, is characterized by syncope, sudden death, following exercise and, or emotional stress, and it can be also induced by uh, uh, catecholamine infusion. And it's been linked to mutations in the rinding receptor, called sequestrin, and also triad. So the last time I checked, so most of them, of course, uh, uh, related to mutations in the rinding receptor, the largest of these proteins. There is about now 14 or maybe more mutations uh, uh, that lead to CPVT associated with muta mutations in called sequestrin. There is at least one mutation in, in triadic, the linker uh, protein that uh, leads to uh, CPVT or have been associated with CPVT. So we kind of were very, so I mentioned, happy about seeing this kind of uh, reports. And we already sort of had a, an explanation, uh, not only explanation, but also all the, the tools in the lab how to sort of check uh, what's going on, the, the, the underlying molecular me or cellular mechanisms uh, underlying this, this, these types of arrhythmias. So we already had our sort of viruses. And uh, so what, what we did, so we, we, we generated a virus expressing one particular mutation uh, causing CPVT. And again, these uh, recordings, uh, electrical recordings, and simultaneous calcium recording uh, that show that uh, addition of isopropanol, uh, we have sort of the, uh, the calcium release becomes sort of very uh, de destabilized. So we have these spontaneous calcium oscillations occurring in, in cardiac myocytes. And every time when a spontaneous uh, release or spontaneous waves, as they also called sometimes occur, there is also a depolarization uh, in, in, this, in the membrane, and some of this depolarization actually lead to full-blown full extrasystolic action potentials. And uh, of course, sort of the, the mechanisms as to how increase in calcium leads to these DADs is relatively well established. As I mentioned, it involves the electrogenic sodium calcium exchange. And this is simply because uh, the fact that for the so sodium calcium exchange, it extrudes calcium from the cell when calcium becomes elevated, and it extrudes one calcium ion for the expense of letting three sodium ions in. So this is what leads to depolarization of the surface membrane. Uh, so uh, this has been kind of known for some time, but what is sort of the mechanisms of uh, uh, generation uh, of, of spontaneous waves? So uh, according to our hypothesis, it was that you know uh, mutations in calcium impair its ability to inhibit the rinding receptor in the diastolic phase to uh, uh, produce uh, the uh, necessary refractory period in the, in the, during diastole. And uh, so we tested this uh, directly by measuring uh, calcium release restitution, which is sort of a, a, a regular standard protocol for assessing refractoriness. So basically what you do, you, you apply a two pulse protocol, uh, uh, a, a first pulse and then a, a test pulse, and you apply them sort of at, at different time intervals. And basically uh, from, the, from the timing of recovery of the calcium transient after the first pre-pulse, you can sort of 
establish the kinetic of restitution uh, or the time refractory time of, of, of release. Or, and we can see that indeed in cells that express uh, this uh, uh, arrhythmogenic mutant, uh, the refractory period is much faster. And then we also went uh, perform uh, lipid bilayer experiments using the wild type and mutant L sequestrin. So in the wild type, is the wild type of sequestrin, so if you just add it to the grinding receptors split of the, that didn't have L sequestrin, so then uh, the channel activity goes down. So it inhibits, as, as I showed earlier, and the mutant L sequestrin fails uh, to inhibit the channel consistent with this sort of conclusion uh, that indeed mutations, CPVT mutations, uh, interfere or impair the ability of luminal calcium and L sequestrin to uh, uh, produce a normal sort of state of refractoriness during the diastolic phase. So uh, at this point, so we can say that during no normal calcium handling, luminal calcium and cal sequestrin, they, so this process of uh, luminal calcium dependent deactivation uh, induces this uh, sort of brings the uh, brings the calcium signal into this refractory state and this is stabilizes calcium cycling and in CPVT genetic mutations in L sequestrin rhinin triadin results in shortened or impaired refractoriness and this results in rhythmic uh, disturbances in the membrane potential uh, 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 disturbances in uh, spontaneous calcium releases and, uh, and uh, disturbances in the membrane potentials, DADs and ecstasy systolic action. Yes. yes. So um, just back to your uh, the slide, I, I just want to know, so if you have a... This one? No, no yeah, that's one. This yeah, one. that's one. Yeah, that's one. If you have a shorthand, uh, a shortened uh, refract, uh, you know, refractoriness, does that mean that you have more of a release and then eventually you will have depletion of the SR calcium or you have more of the uh, calcium pump to, uh, uh, to, you know, the circa to actually uh, work more? Is that true? I mean, what, what happens that if you, if the rounding receptor is not inhibited, right? following the release, so you have more then, release. then right after circa pumps back calcium inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it would get released again spontaneously because there is nothing to, to inhibit it from spontaneous activation. Okay. Uh, so I think what he's asking is whether eventually, if that continues, you'll deplete the SR. I mean, you, you reach a steady state. So, uh, and we will see that maybe actually later. So, uh, the, the reason actually this arrhythmias occur uh, during catecholinergic stimulation, because uh, catecholinergic st stimulation enhances the, the work of the calcium pump. So whenever, you know, following like normal systolic release, calcium is released, then the pump, because in the presence of, for instance, isopreterenol, it pumps back calcium really fast, but because the rinding receptor is not sort of kept in check, it sort of releases calcium and then the pump just pumps it back, but then once uh, the pump pumps back calcium, it gets released again. So, and it's sort of a, it, it reaches a certain kind of steady state. That's where the oscillation. You don't take into account the small amount that is pumped back out of the cell to the sudden calcium exchanger, it's a closed system. So it reaches a new steady state and then everything is happening fast. Yes. 
So, and uh, that's we sort of became interested in looking in other systems because uh, CPVT, although it's, you know, very kind of instructive, a, a very interesting kind of situation when you have, a, you know, a, a genetic defect in one particular, is one particular protein, you know, those diseases are relatively rare. And uh, so we were interested sort of looking into, you know, uh, other much more common acquired types of cardiac arrhythmias that been also for some time thought to be, you know, associated with abnormal calcium handling. And we use this canine model Boston Farshan Southern Cardiac Death in collaboration with, with George Billman, who sort of worked with this model for many years. And the advantage of this model that is extremely, it's high, highly reproducible. And sort of, we also at the myocyte level, we looked sort of the same kind of protocols. Uh, we looked uh, at the behavior of these cells so under control conditions, so up calcium cycling, electrical activity, normal, but in the presence of uh, isopreterenol, uh, sorry, these are these are like control cells, uh, normal cells. So uh, uh, without iso and following iso, uh, the uh, the the uh, calcium cycling is normal except that ISO increases the amplitude of the calcium transients and the decay time because it kind of accelerates the calcium pump. But in, in a, a VF uh, myocytes, what we see that in the presence of ISO, we have this spontaneous releases, you know, between the regular induced calcium transients and they associate with, with DADs and uh, like full-blown action potentials, it's just like very similar to the situation in CPVT. So we also kind of went ahead and used our sort of refractorium or restitution protocol, except that in this case we went uh, a little bit further and in addition to measuring uh, changes in cytosolic calcium during our, you know, two-pulse protocol, we also simultaneously measured uh, changes in calcium inside the sarcoplasm reticulum using this low affinity uh, calcium indicator. And uh, so using this sort of uh, dual uh, sort of uh, calcium uh, imaging or, or tracing dual compartment calcium reporting, we were sort of able to also assess the, the role of luminal calcium in the restitution process. And so uh, basically the results can be seen in this plot where we sort of uh, plot actually the uh, changes in cytosolic calcium during the restitution process with the uh, corresponding you know, uh, status of luminal calcium concentration and when we sort of compare the curves obtained in control and VF myocytes, we see that, you know, the, this uh, curve is shifted to the left, which simply means that in uh, VF myocytes, the uh, decrease in luminal calcium becomes much less effective in, uh, in sort of keeping the uh, calcium signaling in refractory state. So we, we have sort of, uh, because of enhanced calcium sensitivity in the system, so now the uh, restitution is, is kind of much faster. And again, uh, at the single channel level, we can also sort of check the uh, dependency of single Rhinin receptor activity on changes in luminal calcium concentration. And so the summarizing graph shows here that this is how the activity of the Rhinin receptor 
kind of depends on changes in luminal calcium concentration in normal uh, hearts, and this is how in, in, in VF hearts. So the luminal calcium, basically, it's not very, or declines in luminal calcium to not become uh, effective in uh, reducing grinding receptor activity. And uh, uh, so in, in the case of uh, genetic mutations, in case of CPVT, of course, the underlying molecular defect is, is clear. Uh, it's the actual genetic mutation, but what about the molecular mechanisms, you know, causing grinding receptor defects in these acquired forms of arrhythmia? And we know that the grinding receptor undergoes uh, post-translational modifications that can change its kind of activity. First of all, it's phosphorylation by TKA and CAM kinase. It gets phosphorylated, and we know that changes in phosphorylation status can change in cardiac disease. And also, uh, with, uh, grinding receptor activity can also change as a result of redox modifications. There are there are about 90, 90 reactive files targets for uh, redox modification in the uh, grinding receptor. So here I will uh, just kind of, uh, mention our experiments uh, that address the role of uh, uh, changes in ROS reactive oxygen species. So if we just measure sort of the redox <coughs> status of cardiac myocytes, we'll see that with a fluorescent indicator, we can see that ROS is much higher in VF myocytes. And then in sort of in a functional uh, experiments using our functional assay, what we did, we used uh, uh, an antioxidant MPG. We put it on top of VF myocytes that normally had this sort of uh, uh, abnormal diastolic releases and by putting after putting this antioxidant MPG we were sort of able to you know, rescue or normalize calcium cycling uh, so suggesting that indeed uh, sort of redox modification uh, can contribute to sort of this uh, destabilization of calcium release and again is our restitution protocol uh, remember in uh, VF, uh, in VF the restitution or the uh, uh, refractoriness of, of calcium signaling is sort of is, is, is impaired, is shortened, and with MPG uh, we able sort of to slow it to make it uh, sort of close to normal. And so this point, so we can sort of generalize uh, our kind of uh, hypothesis to also include acquired defects in uh, grinding receptor and in particular redox modification that both sort of genetic and acquired uh, defects in grinding receptors can sort of lead uh, to uh, sort of to result in arrhythmogenesis through uh, shortening calcium release uh, refractoriness. Uh, so, so far I've been kind of talking about uh, arrhythmogenic mechanisms at the level of a single myocyte, but of course arrhythmia, it's not a, a single cell kind of phenomena, it involves like, you know, whole cardiac tissue, and uh, actually there is, uh, you know, this, this question that, you know, even if you are able to kind of see uh, like extrasystolic action potentials in single myocytes, which theoretically could you know result in a, sort of uh, a trigger arrhythmia, this situation actually not that straightforward. If you look in, in the context of cardiac tissue, this because of the source symptoms. Uh, mismatch. So if you, let's say, have a, a spontaneous release of calcium in one of the myocytes, you know, within the tissue, that the depolarization caused by this calcium uh, would be sort of 
uh, sucked out of the polarizing current by neighboring electrically connected cells. So some calculations actually uh, show that you need uh, from 10,000 to 100,000 of cells to generate, you know, spontaneously, spontaneous, uh, to generate spontaneous releases at the same time to be able to generate, you know, uh, an action potential at the, uh, in the tissue level. So what's then the mechanism for synchronization? How, how uh, spontaneous release would be sort of, can be synchronized between, you know, in, in many, many cells composing the, you know, the three-dimensional myocardium for the depolarization to be able to reach the threshold required for, you know, generation of the action potential. So this kind of studies in individual myocytes don't give you answer uh, to this question. Ne nevertheless, so we actually started to, when thinking about how this uh, would occur, we went back to our sort of single myocyte studies, and uh, what we noticed that in uh, our CPVT myocytes, in this case, this was done in a, in a genetic mouse model, so now instead of uh, using uh, using uh, viruses and uh, cell culture. This is actually uh, a knocking genetic mouse model. And we have sort of the same uh, typical uh, calcium sort of activation pattern with lots of spontaneous releases and with shortened refractoriness. And so when we looked at distribution of spontaneous releases, we found that most of them sort of occur during a particular time. In other words, the occurrence is highly clustered. So this kind of gave us an uh, idea that perhaps, you know, this shortened kind of refractoriness combined with the fact that, you know, in the stimulated cells, you know, uh, refractoriness would be always kind of aligned between different cells would be aligned uh, according to the uh, uh, to the electrically induced calcium transient. We thought that, oh, maybe this kind of shortened refractoriness would provide a mechanism for synchronization of uh, apparent uh, abnormal calcium release in intact tissue. And then we sort of uh, decided to directly test this. So we used uh, intercardiac tissue, uh, mouse trabecular, uh, and uh, loaded with fluorescent calcium dyes. And then in this case, sort of in our field of view, there are multiple myocytes. So now instead of one cell, we have yeah, a preparation that has, uh, in this case, more than four cells, and then again we, we sort of uh, look at it in, in, in wild type myocyte, everything is kind of fine. We have rhythmic normal calcium uh, transients, but in the CPVT mouse myocyte, we actually have again the spontaneous releases, and if we look, uh, then the turn out to be highly synchronized, occur almost simultaneously uh, between neighboring cells. So indeed there is a, a high level of synchronization. And then it turns out that using uh, dantralin, which is a sort of a calcium running receptor channel a stabilizer, we can desynchronize calcium release. And uh, so uh, as a sort of a potential strategy for a, a proof of concept for an anti-arrhythmia strategy. And here, 
talking about uh, therapy, uh, we know that it's uh, kind of attempts to find really effective therapy uh, for arrhythmia. It has been very, very challenging. And uh, uh, so recently, uh, sodium channel uh, inhibitors uh, sort of uh, showed some kind of promise, at least for the treatment of, of CPVT. And so, so we decided to kind of investigate uh, from our standpoint with, with our tools what sort of may be going on here and see whether we can sort of uh, learn something to uh, improve uh, uh, this, this kind of approach. At the present time, so there are uh, basically uh, two, two uh, hypotheses sort of or, or mechanism put forward to explain how uh, non-selective sodium channel blockades such as flaconide can reduce antiarrhythmic effect in, in CPVT. One first uh, sort of uh, put forward by by Bjorn Molman is that these channels uh, somehow act uh, not actually on the, uh, I mean, flaconite, this blocker actually act not on the uh, sodium channel, but uh, somehow inhibits the rinding receptor channel. And this is how he explained its antiarrhythmic effects. On the other hand, uh, other thought that it still kind of acts on the sodium channel simply by inhibiting excitability. And we sort of considered uh, an alternative uh, mechanism, quite sort of unexpected. First, uh, a very talented uh, fellow in my lab, Press Radwanski, sort of he had this sort of hunch. Uh, he noticed that uh, tetrodotoxin is able to inhibit uh, arrhythmias at extremely low concentrations. And we know that the uh, voltage-dependent sodium channels, NAP1.5, uh, uh, that endogenous to, to the heart, the cardiac types, they uh, have a much uh, uh, lower sensitivity to, 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 T, to TTX, so some, something kind of didn't, didn't uh, fit here. And then we also uh, kind of realized that uh, cardiac or, or learned uh, that uh, the cardiac myocytes express a certain type of sodium channels that can be found mostly in neurons. So these are the neuronal uh, type of sodium channels that are TTX sensitive. So he came up with this kind of uh, uh, crazy hypothesis that maybe somehow the antiarrhythmic effects of, of uh, sodium channel blockers are mediated by these uh, neuronal sodium channels. And basically, uh, the, the hypothesis sort of involved uh, a local sodium calcium subdomain, and we knew from previous and of literature that indeed the sodium, uh, these neuronal sodium channels are localized basically in the T tubule, T tubules, and uh, presumably close to the uh, sodium calcium exchange and rinding receptors. So our hypothesis kind of involved the, the, the following sort of uh, mechanism that the, these sodium channels pass sodium to the narrow cleft and that sort of activates sodium calcium exchange now in the reverse mode so it takes out sodium but brings in calcium and bringing calcium into these clefts kind of sensitizes the grinding receptor channel and so we, we went forward uh, test this hypothesis so one of the 
sort of approaches that he used, he used a specific uh, inhibitor of this uh, neuronal sodium channels, realizol, uh, that have been shown to block uh, several types of this neuronal so-called uh, uh, sodium channels. And it has been actually used to treat some uh, neuronal uh, diseases. Uh, and sort of he decided he, he put this uh, inhibitor on a, a multicellular trabecular preparation uh, in the presence of isopropanol showed this kind of crazy uh, rhythmic type of activity. A lot of lots of sort of uh, uh, synchronized uh, calcium releases between the regular uh, calcium transient electrically induced calcium transients, and indeed, uh, so realizol increased decreased, inhibited the uh, spontaneous kind of waves and also desynchronized them to a, a great extent. And uh, so again, uh, basically as we sort of uh, so before, so with a, a so in, in order to overcome the source sync ma match, you need to sort of synchronize release in many cells and in order to prevent arrhythmia so you need to somehow desynchronize or uh, restore the sourcing mismatch and basically to see whether this kind of was happening we uh, sort of used actually a, a dual uh, labeling dual recording we also measured uh, action potential with a voltage sensitive dye simultaneously with, with calcium and we can see that indeed the real result, uh, in addition to kind of inhibiting and desynchronizing uh, the spontaneous releases also reduce greatly the frequency of uh, induced uh, uh, action potentials and so basically he also confirmed the, the effect, antiarrhythmic effect of real it was all in, in mice, in mouse, in, in, in vivo. Uh, so, do, do I still have time? Yeah, I think we should sort of wrap it up if possible. Okay. So, here I just wanted to show you kind of a, a, another interesting sort of manifestation of uh, what synchronization of release can sort of lead to or produce in this case in atrial tissue uh, potentially kind of uh, giving some sort of explanation to atrial fibrillations so what is interesting here so this is an atrial myocyte that is sort of initially left sort of uh, it's not paced so we have and this is also from the CPVT mouse. So the, 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 in, in this mouse, not only ventricular myocytes, but also atrial myocytes are sort of prone to spontaneous activate, spontaneous releases. And uh, so when the myocyte is not paced, so we have these occasional sort of spontaneous releases, but, but when we uh, stimulate the cell with a single Sort of stimulus, we can trigger sort of uh, long runs of this kind of repetitive activity. And if we kind of zoom in, if we see what's happening here. So this is actually this is the calcium transient uh, triggered by electrical excitation. Uh, there is a corresponding action potential, and what we think what's happening is that it sort of aligns refractoriness of multiple sort of release sites and results in sort of synchronous activation of spontaneous release and when this uh, spontaneous release uh, becomes sufficiently synchronous it can 
trigger another action potential. And then this action potential now in turn can also synchronize or align refractoriness for the subsequent uh, spontaneous beat. So we call it sort of a, a leap, leap from uh, interplay between voltage and calcium uh, mechanisms that drive rhythmic activity in CPVT atrial cells. And this can be again observed in a multicellular atrial tissue. So we can see that, so in this case, the tissue there is about 18 cells. We pace and stop pacing, but there is a sort of a, a repetitive activity that carries itself. And we can see it like in this enlarged image, so two cells from, from this preparation. You can see that, you know, the release spontaneous release after the action potential is highly synchronized and it triggers an action potential. And then, so this is what we call like a leapfrog mechanism, like an action potential synchronizes, uh, aligns refractoriness in multiple release sites, in multiple cells to a, a degree that, you know, the release becomes synchronous enough to trigger an action potential. And then now this new action potential again aligns uh, refractoriness and, and so on. So we kind of also call it, uh, so this mechanism, a, a composite sort of oscillator when, you know, uh, you need both uh, the calcium component and the electrical component to, to generate uh, sort of a, 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 a rhythmic activity and we think that it would be sort of would contribute to underlying mechanisms of atrial fibrillation. And what is interesting that also Rilazole can inhibit this uh, this uh, this repetitive activity, presumably through the same mechanism uh, that. Uh, it inhibited arrhythmogenesis in ventricular myocytes. So in conclusion, uh, uh, what I kind of uh, would like kind of